Va a intervenir a continuación Bob Yesop. Bob Yesop eh, es catedrático distinguido de Sociología de la Lancaster University. Es uno de los principales expertos mundiales en el ámbito de la gobernanza. Es doctor honoris causa por las universidades de Malmo, Roskilde y Córdoba, Argentina. Miembro electo de la Academy of Social Science. Ha sido profesor visitante en diferentes instituciones académicas y de investigación de prestigio, como el Instituto Max Planck, la Copenhague Business School o la Fundación Rosa Luxemburg. Ha publicado 22 libros y más de 300 artículos académicos sobre estos temas. ¿no? Eh, sobre todo, eh, yo creo que, que el profesor que vamos a tener el privilegio de escuchar ahora eh, juega un papel fundamental en lo, que, en lo que tiene que ser la universidad, ¿no? eh, como, como agitador de pensamiento. Eh, Bob Gessop es una persona que, que cuestiona y que, y que desde un sentido crítico y fundamentado pone en cuestión categorías y asunciones que nosotros pues, eh, tomamos muchas veces por hecho, como lo que es la globalización, como lo que es la gobernanza, como son muchos de los conceptos de los que hemos hablado de estos dos días, ¿no? Y, por lo tanto, es absolutamente necesario para finalmente identificar cuáles son los retos y cuáles son las soluciones de una sociedad que queremos más libre, más, más justa y, y más democrática. Por lo tanto, sin añadir nada más, eh, le, dejo, le dejo la palabra. Eh, Bob, when you want, thank you. Ok, many, many thanks for the invitation here. I have followed the discussions with great interest. And I tend to be a very theoretical person, but I want to start with an observation about where my interest in governance and meta-governance came from. In the late 1980s, the British government was growingly recognizing not only had markets failed, which is why we developed the mixed economy, that the state had failed, which is why we went down the road of neoliberalism, but also that markets were failing under the Thatcher government. And it came up with a brilliant new idea. It couldn't re-describe the turn to public-private partnerships as the return to the state. So it said that what we're going to promote is governance. And I'm a very contrarian thinker and I was invited to participate in a national research evaluation of whether or not local governance, local private partnerships worked. And as a contrarian thinker, I was the person who put in for a research grant to study not governance, but governance failure. And they thought, well, we'll just let this guy play with his silly ideas, because we all know that governance is going to work. But when I was doing my interviews with people charged with implementing governance, they expressed the feeling that they were complete and utter failures. They had been told that perhaps markets fail, perhaps the state fails, but governance will work. And they found it really difficult to make governance work. And they concluded that there was their personal incompetence, their personal inabilities, their personal failures that were responsible for the inability to make governance work in Manchester, or the inability to make governance work in the East Thames Corridor, and so forth. And I continued my discussions with them. And we began to identify through discussion that in fact it wasn't their personal responsibility that governance wasn't working in Manchester or the East Thames Corridor or North West Kent. It was the difficulties of governing effectively in any way at all. And that's why I describe my presentation today as continuing in this theme of being contrarian. I haven't been able to participate in every single presentation because I was taken off to meet a very successful example of governance in terms of social services in this province and learnt a great deal from that also about the conditions under which governance might work and not just the conditions under which it might fail. But 
to the extent that I've been able to listen to the presentations, there is an assumption that we have a formula, governance, and it's going to be the answer to our problems. The formulae have been different. It may be the Department of State in the United States that discovered and created an office of partnerships. And we heard a lot about that is in terms of the technical details of how you do it. But I then went off to the web page of the Department of State and saw this is not a technical exercise at all, but it's part of the soft power of the Department of State strongly tied to the defense and diplomatic interests of the United States, which suggests to me that if Russia or Brazil or the European Union or the United Kingdom or the Basque country thought, wouldn't it be a good idea to set up an office of partnerships, I don't mind betting they would come up with a rather different way of embedding partnership in a broader set of political objectives. I've heard a lot about civic action or how we can promote technical innovation and so forth. And all of this is very important. These are real problems. But what I want to do is to think about under what conditions might these be successful and how do we cope with the fact that more often than not, these projects will fail. And then how do we deal with the reality of failure? There's a very nice article I came across in the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Sociology. I'm sure that's not available in the libraries here in the Basque country or indeed many places else. And it was called The Sociology of Failure. And I thought, what a brilliant title, The Sociology of Failure. And the main point they were making is that sociology, which by tradition is a rather critical way of thinking, has never taken failure seriously. That sociologists want to talk more about what works than why things fail. And in fact, failure is the norm, success is the exception. And how do we deal with that? So that's by way of introduction, so you can see when I get very theoretical, there is actually a, a much more practical motivation behind my remarks. So this is one of those nice, warm, fuzzy images of governance, everybody working together. No hierarchy here, slightly different tones of the skin and so forth, and everybody working together very harmoniously. But I want to ask another question before we discuss what makes for good governance, which is why are we talking about governance? Why are we talking about it now? Is it just putting old wine in new bottles? Has governance always been with us, but now we call it governance before we called it something else? Or is there something more significant going on that governance has now entered much more seriously, much more firmly, the public agenda? Then I'm going to offer a definition of governance. I'm not claiming my definition is correct. There are so many different definitions of governance, even among people that share my broad perspective, there will be differences. But I think that itself is an interesting challenge, because if we're talking about what will make governance work well, if there are a thousand different definitions of governance for different scales, for different problems, for different objects, that's going to be a major issue that we need to cover. So I'm going to give you my definition of governance. I'm going to address the complexity of governance and the governance of complexity, because that's my entry point. And here I think we share something. I'm also strongly influenced by the work of Niklas Luhmann and the problems of governing, or indeed of reducing complexity in order to go on in the world. And if we take the world as inherently complex, and indeed some would argue becoming more complex, how you deal with complexity is one of the most significant issues facing problems of governance in the way that it's been discussed here. Then I'm going to produce my contrarian approach. I've already explained why I'm a contrarian. 
I think it's partly my personality, partly my life experience. But as you see, I'm still happy, I'm smiling, I'm also somebody who believes the glass is half full rather than half empty. So my contrarian approach is not a message of doom, it is a measure in part of optimism and looking for what we can get out of governance. But in order to do that, I have to go down the route of governance failure before I get to the prospects for governance working. And I'm going to talk very briefly about collaborative governance as a case of multi-level governance. Although I must admit, since I've arrived here, I have discovered that multi-level governance in the Basque country is even more complicated than I had possibly imagined, and yet it seems to be working. So I think there are some interesting lessons uh, to be learnt in that regard. And then building on one of the earlier presentations about territorial governance, I'm going to refer to what I call multispatial meta-governance, which is more than just multi-level, more than just particular tiers of governance. And then a lot of people have suggested, although it hasn't been suggested as far as I'm aware in this conference, that if governance fails, the answer is meta-governance, organizing the conditions for self-organization, reorganizing the ways in which markets operate so they work better, introducing a new constitution so states fail less often, or at least fail in different ways. And the problem is, if everything fails, meta-governance fails too. There is no answer at a meta-level where if governance fails, meta-governance is guaranteed to succeed. And then I'm going to ask the question, what is to be done? And I'm going to provide you with an answer. So why governance, why now? I'm not asking the translators to read all of these out. That's just a small sample of the different discourses of governance that have emerged in the last 10, 15, 20 years. And there are many more. I could have filled numerous slides with new discourses of governance. In fact, it's a fairly chaotic concept rather than a clearly defined concept. And that already indicates some problems with rolling out governance, because what governance means in clinical governance, or what it means in environmental governance, or what it means at the level of global governance or local governance is bound to be different. And we have to be very careful that we don't get confused by our ability all to refer to governance, to think we're all referring to the same thing. But that's enough of that. So what is governance? And several of the presentations that I've heard here do indeed relate it to the problem of complexity. That governance is particularly appropriate in the face of the growing complexity of the real world. And I would define governance as a means to coordinate social relations, and that means very broadly, not just economic relations or political relations, but social relations very broadly interpreted, characterized by complex reciprocal interdependence. And we heard a little bit earlier, twice I think now, about the difficulties of a purely linear approach to trying to plan in the face of complexity. And that's why I think governance has become more important and in the approach that I adopt, which is also important for thinking about the nature of failure, I distinguish four main forms of governance. The anarchy of exchange, if you like, the invisible hand. The hierarchy of command, the iron fist is the friendly metaphor, perhaps in a velvet glove. Governance as it's conventionally understood now, why this conference is being organized as reflexive self-organization. And I've been very influenced by some of the Danish debates on the negotiated economy. And one of my Danish colleagues said what we can call reflexive self-organization is the visible handshake. We're equals and we can agree to work on a particular problem. It's sometimes called heterarchy, but I don't think we need that term. And then the solidarity 
of unconditional loyalty or trust, the tacit handshake. And for an hour earlier today, I was taken off to meet people involved in social services in this province and struck by the extent to which governance here is working because of the very strong importance of solidarity. That's often neglected in discussions of governance. People talk about the market, or they talk about organization and hierarchy, or they even talk about networks. But the importance of solidarity, of an unconditional loyalty, it obviously works best in small units, but to see the extent to which it's been scaled up in the Basque country, for me, was very impressive. It's going to be one of the lessons that I take away from my participation in this conference, that solidarity is a neglected mode of governance because of its flexibility and so forth. These four modes, anarchy, hierarchy, networking, if you like, solidarity, really exist in pure form. They're very often combined. And if we look at actually existing organizations or structures or systems, we'll see them combined in different ways. And so the implication of that is if we want to understand why governance works or indeed why governance fails, we can't think just in pure types, but actually combinations, mixed combinations. And I'm going to circulate the PowerPoint. If anybody wants it, it will be with, lodged with the organizers. You can request this. That enables me not to have to talk my way through this whole table. But what I want to do is to pick up the beige di uh, column there, which is dialogue, or if you like, reflexive self-organization. Its rationality is reflexive. It's procedural. You don't know in advance when you're entering self-organization what the goals are. You know with markets as, make as much, much profit as possible. You know with hierarchy. These are the goals that we set. Do we succeed in reaching them or not? The point about governance is you discuss the goals, you negotiate them. They are, emerge out of dialogue. Um, the key medium is meaning. In other words, again, discussion, debate, deliberation. The ideal type is an open network. The basis of success is, have we negotiated consent? Do we agree how to proceed? What are the opportunities for renegotiating our objectives? Every mode of governance fails. Market inefficiencies, political ineffectiveness. If we talk about the failure of governance, the standard criticism of British politics, especially parliament, is just a talking shop. It's a lot of noise. It's a lot of politicians showing off. They don't ever achieve anything. Uh, but they keep themselves very happy, and they may win elections again. So there is a way in which dialogue fails, but it's not in terms of inefficiency or ineffectiveness, but talk is continued for the sake of talk and not because it's actually delivering agreed objectives, renegotiated, and so forth. So why governance, why now? I think there are many different reasons, including the fact that people have reflected on the failures of the market or the failures of organization and the state and so forth. But I think we can also say that world society is becoming increasingly integrated. The buzzword, of course, is globalization, but that takes many different forms. And not everything that we call globalization occurs at the level of the globe whatever that might mean. Um, so an increasing number of subsystems. So we have the education system, the legal system, the political system, the health system, the sports system, and the list can continue endlessly with no Archimedean point from which you can govern everything. You remember, give me a lever and I can lift the world. Well, give me a lever and I still wouldn't be able to control the development of world society. It's increasingly recognized that states can't manage national economies for national prosperity and welfare. But on the other hand, there's no world state that can manage the world economy on behalf of world citizens uh, and produce world prosperity and so forth. Even more importantly, and I think this came out in one of the presentations yesterday, is the growing complexity 
of spatiotemporal horizons of action. Uh, you presented me with your book this morning, and I saw that one of the chapters was on acceleration, the speeding up of social relations, the increasing difficulty that we have in keeping up with the pace of change, and other papers have presented that in those terms at all as well. So we have the glacial changes at one level, although glacial changes like climate change are speeding up, and we have on the other hand nanosecond trading, that some shares, increasing number of shares are now traded hundreds of times a minute. Patient capital, I heard about, that's disappearing as the turnover, the churning of shares and so forth increases. And this happens in many different areas. And I think this is a major threat to traditional parliamentary democracy. Politics takes time. Democratic politics takes even more time. And yet we're being increasingly presented with decisions where we don't have time to sit down and debate and so forth. And governance is often seen as an answer to that. We used to think in terms of, well, there's capital and labor, perhaps some declining middle classes, but they don't matter in the big picture. But now the multiplication of social identities, in other words, the multiplication of the number of relevant stakeholders that need to be consulted. Also in terms of the different kinds of knowledge, you were referring to the distributed knowledge and the importance of gathering, overcoming the problems of the division of knowledge. Uh, we may all be citizens where you may all participate in everyday life, but we don't certainly share the same understandings, the same expertise, the same knowledges, but more and more types of expertise need to be brought together. That, again, is one of the things that governance provides us with an answer. And, of course, the rise of organization and network societies that are not suited to reliance on market exchange and are not susceptible to top-down control. So my contrarian approach, and why I think it's met worth emphasizing, because I think this is a very important story that needs to be told about governance. Governance is not the answer. It can be part of an answer. But if you go around telling people, as my local government officials were being told in the late 1980s and 1990s, well, okay, yes, markets fail. State's not been doing such a good job, but now we've got the answer. Well, the answer is governance. You're going to lead to disappointment. So government is being sold, indeed, by consultants, is being marketed as an effective solution to, it says here, new problems. It could also be old problems as well. But my contrarian question, if we know that markets fail, if we know that states fail, why are we so sure that governance is going to work. Perhaps we should be open at the beginning with it opening the space for a little bit of self-doubt so that people then don't assume personal responsibility for these things failing. So if we tell partners that governance is the new answer, this is the new technical fix, this overcomes the problems of the market, this overcomes the problems of the state, governance is going to work, it's going to backfire you're going to demotivate people. Governance is going to lose its legitimacy. People will say, well, then we need to go back to rely on the market. We need to rely on Father State, who's going to tell us what to do, and so forth. So it's better to explain the difficulties of governance than it is to suggest there aren't any difficulties. We must note the inherent limits of all forms of governance. In other words, I'm not saying governance is going to fail, let's go back to the market. Governance is going to fail, let's go back to the state. Governance is going to fail, as David Cameron discovered in the United Kingdom, and the answer is big society. And civil society is going to help us out because everything else is a pretty much of a mess uh, in the period in the United Kingdom. We must recognize the inevitability of contradictions and dilemmas. We hear a lot about the inevitability of globalization. We don't hear about the inevitability of contradictions. That in fact, there are some things that can't be managed because they're inherently contradictory. But my argument about contradictions is a contradiction is also a dilemma. 
So what appears to be a, a purely structural contradiction can be turned into something that we can think about. I'll give you just one example. I use it with my neoliberal students who trained in economics. I ask them, is the wage a cost of production? Yes, they say. I say, is it a source of demand? Oh, yes, they say. And then I say, what are the consequences of increasing neoliberalization when you're pushing down the wage and the social wage? The answer is less demand. And then we wonder why increasing inequalities of wealth, increasing inequalities of income, the inability of economies to respond to quantitative easing and so forth is occurring because neoliberalism one-sidedly emphasizes the wage and the social wage as a cost of production or a cost of international production and doesn't say where is the demand going to come from in future. I think this is also a problem with thinking that robots are going to replace everybody who works. I did like the idea of taxing robots because at least that would create the demand or uh, rather the resources to expand uh, the welfare state. So we need to look at the inevitability of contradictions, but not see that in a fatalistic way. A contradiction is the source of a dilemma. That's the source of deliberation, of discussion. How we want to strike these balances, how we deal with these dilemmas. And we need to identify the conditions for effective governance and think about how to respond to governance failure. So complexity and governance of deep complexity. Um, my basic argument is the world is complex, so complex that we can't even provide a theory of complexity. I think that was one of the brilliant insights of Nicholas Luhmann, who said the world is so complex that we need to reduce complexity to go on in the world. And he concluded from that, not that we need a theory of complexity, because a theory of complexity is itself a reduction of complexity, which is why there are so many competing theories of complexity. We need to see how people reduce complexity in order to go on in the world. And I think the different kinds of governance, markets is one way to reduce complexity. You rely on the anonymity, the anarchy of the market. Command is another way of reducing complexity. You delegate authority to parliamentarians, to the state, to the police, and they do things on your behalf, and every so often you punish them by throwing them out of office. Self-organization is a way of reducing complexity. We heard yesterday about the wisdom of crowds. I may not know everything, but between us, we might be able to pool our resources and our knowledge and reduce complexity in that way, within certain limits. Or solidarity, unconditional support. We can't anticipate the future, but if there's a fire in our local community, we can rely on one person at least from every household in uh, this province going out to help put the fire out. We don't have to plan that in advance. That is something that you do automatically and adapt in very flexible ways in these conditions. So these are different ways of reducing complexity. They have different advantages and different disadvantages. And what we need then, why this is important, is we can't understand the world in all its complexity in real time, if ever. There are an awful lot of what are called wicked problems that are almost unmanageable. All we can do is to put off the consequences or displace them elsewhere. And we need not a complete repertoire that covers every eventuality, that would be impossible, but at least a minimum set of ways of dealing with these things. Let me move on. So I talked about governance failure, and now I'm going to point you a different direction. Markets work if they efficiently allocate scarce resources to competing ends. Organizations and states work if they can commit you to a collective goal and achieve it. Dialogue works if you can reach negotiated consent. Solidarity works when there are unconditional commitments. They can fail in different ways. But what I want to stress here, without going into full details, is different modes of governance are good for different purposes and they fail in different ways. And one of the major challenges that we have is to knowing where 
allocation of scarce resources to competing ends is our primary problem. Rely on the market. Where is reaching agreement on a collective goal and then acting on it the most important? Then you might want to rely on hierarchy, on command. We don't even know what the problems facing us are, but we know we're facing a problem. Then you might want to start with dialogue, with uh, negotiated consent. And we heard a little bit about that in relation to civic action yesterday. First find out the facts, first draw on a pool of expertise and knowledge and so forth. How do we respond to governance failure? Uh, Firstly, you might think, oh, well, there's something wrong with the market. We'll just redesign the incentives in the market. Fine. There's something wrong with the way in which the state is working. Let's reform it. Uh, so people very rarely say, the market is failing immediately. Let's call in the state. The first thing they try to do is to improve the market, to improve the state, to think about, have we got the design of self-organization, self-reflection right or not? Um, then you can think about how much market, how much state, how much ne networking do we need. And then at a broader level, um, how are we going to balance these different things? And this is what I call calibration. So again, not going into detail, in, when markets fail, you redesign individual markets, you have more or less regulation. You try to downplay the role of finance and increase the role of industrial capital or vice versa and so forth and so forth. So what's regional governance? How does that fit into this context? I must admit this is a misunderstanding on my part. I thought we were talking about regional collaborative government or governance for regional development, but in fact it's how might we understand collaborative government at the level of the provinces within the Basque country, within Spain, in relation to the European Union, in relation to the North Middle East and North Africa and sort of across all different scales. But I think one of the points I do want to make, and we discussed this in the interview session, that one of the things that gets ignored in discussions of governance is you can't govern in the abstract. You have to govern in relation to a particular space, place, territory, network in some cases, in relation to particular time horizons. And one of the biggest difficulties facing governance is that you think that all of the problems that are causing governance failure are located just here, or on the other hand, it's all the fault of global economy, or it's all the fault of our very short-term time horizons. If only we think long-term, all the problems will be solved. And one of the points I want to make is that when we're thinking about designing governance, we have to do really serious work identifying what is the particular object of governance that we're trying to govern. You don't govern in general. You govern <coughs> particular things, and they have their own specific spatio-temporal features that have to be integrated into and become part of the ways in which you govern. And, of course, there's then issues of the size of regions and so forth. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that, and, uh, and for the sake of good discussion, I'm going to go back to the question that started my interest in this topic. The British government's view that the state had failed and we must try more market, less state, the neoliberal formula, more market, less state. And then they were discovering it's actually not so easy to roll back the state. We actually do need the state after all, but you couldn't admit that. So they come up with the idea of governance, public-private partnerships. Notice how the state comes in through the back door in terms of governance, public-private partnerships. In Britain, we call it private-public, which suggests the importance of the market, because that comes first. Elsewhere, they talk it public-private, which suggests there's a bigger role uh, for the state. But we brought back um, governance, coordination, dialogue, critical self-reflection. Why? Because a commitment to dialogue reduces the problem of bounded rationality. The different people approach a problem from very narrow 
perspective. I have my take on it, but you've got a different take. How do we overcome that? Dialogue <coughs> enables you to see, and this is a wonderful phrase from Niklas Luhmann, one cannot see what one cannot see. In other words, you can't even see what your blind spot is, but by talking with people with different perspectives, you can see what you've neglected. And so one of the major advantages of dialogue is you see what you cannot see because somebody else can see it. Uh, a problem shared, we say in England, is a problem halved. So this is one of the major advantages behind governance. You need to lock partners into interdependent decisions over different time horizons. One of the major issues about governance, about markets, is opportunism. And I saw that in the case studies that I was doing, that you're looking at a long-term economic development project. The benefits from that are not equally distributed over time. Some people are going to be the immediate beneficiaries, the real estate developers. Some people are going to be people that benefit much further down the road. And if you're not careful, people come in Real estate development's a fantastic example. They make their profits and they're gone. And they're no longer committed to taking part in your partnership. A well-designed partnership mechanism means that people are locked in. You're going to get some of your rewards now, some later. If you have to wait, then we're going to give you some side payments to keep you in the game and so forth. And it develops solidarity because it emphasizes the fact that interdependencies exist and you come to recognize those. And it's good for developing the sense of loyalty or trust. What are some favorable conditions for it? Simplifying models and practices that are fit for purpose. As I said, we can't model the whole world in all its complexity. So to go on, we need simplifications, but there are good simplifications and bad simplifications. So the good simplifications are the one that are at least fit for purpose. You can't model everything, but you have to include the key factors. You have to stabilize people's orientations, expectations, rules of conduct. One of the lessons I've taken away from my few days here is the very strong sense of regional identity, that there's a common set of expectations, that the extent of inequalities of wealth and income here are very low, that it's a relatively polycentric society, not highly polarized between a center and a periphery, all of which is quite helpful for stabilizing expectations, getting people committed. Develop the capacity for dynamic, interactive learning. The very first night I was here, we had a wonderful dinner in the Basque Culinary Center, and in between very nice Nouvelle Basque cuisine, I heard again and again and again the importance of reflection, the importance of learning, the importance of thinking about mistakes. Obviously, at the last lot of politicians, but recognizing we might make mistakes too. And then developing the capacity for self-reflexive self-organization. So, wonderful. We know why it's better. We know what the conditions are, and they seem to exist. So if it's so smart, why does governance fail? Smart governance is one of the buzzwords. Uh, Niling, my wife, who's sitting here when we first met, or not when we first met, she was very polite. She waited at least for two weeks and then said, the difference between you and me, Bob, is that you're clever, but I'm wise. And I think we need to think about smart governance it may be clever, but is it wise? And one of the big problems is that we're so bound up with let's roll out this technical fix, smart governance, you don't necessarily do it wisely. And these are some of the things that we need to take account of if we want not only smart governance, but wise governance, which is recognize there are a lot of problems in maintaining dialogue. It's very time consuming. Recognize that the environments in which we're trying to govern are very turbulent. One of the big things that one hears about is we're going to share our expertise. We're going to work out what best practice is. In a very turbulent environment, by the time you've worked out what best practice is, it's no longer best practice. It was best practice a year or two years or 10 years ago. So we have to be very careful about fixing 
a particular solution as the one-size-fits-all best solution for everything, particularly when there's a lot of turbulence in the environment, and there is a lot of turbulence in the environment. Different definitions of the object of governance. Objects of governance don't exist out there in the real world. I can't look through the window here, well, certainly not today with the beautiful weather, and say, ah, I can see five objects of governance that need governing. There's an awful lot of debate about, well, actually, what is the problem? People disagree what the problem of governance is. And even if they then reach agreement, the way to deal with it is very different. More market, less state, more networking, more solidarity. So a big problem with organizing governance and self-reflection is how do you identify the objects of governance? How do you agree what the particular problems that they present us with are? And how do you deal with the fact there are competing projects for the same object of governance? Uh, if you remember my first slide, it was a map of Europe. That comes from the European Space Organization Network looking at spatial governance. And what's interesting, it looks like a map of Europe. Actually, it's a composite of all of the different regional governance projects that they're looking at. And some want to manage a region, some want to manage a cross-border region, some want to organize a province, some want to organize the national economy, some want to organize something else. And so we have not only an agreement, this is the problem, an agreement, this is the object, but then you find that different people are pursuing different projects in relation to it. Again, a recipe for failure and for chaos. There are specific dilemmas, inappropriate instruments, limits to how far you can displace, and an absence of reflection. Something else, and I haven't heard this mentioned, this is one of my favorite cartoons, uh, other errors have been made, others will be blamed, and Karl Deutsch translates that into cybernetic theory. Power, he says, is the ability not to have to learn from one's mistakes. And until you address governance failure, not only in terms of technical problems, but also in terms of the power dimension. So if I look at the global financial crisis, or as I like to call it, the North Atlantic financial crisis, we can certainly say there's an awful lot of not learning from one's mistakes going on. Banksters are too big to jail, too big to fail. The poor people, the little people, have lost out. And one of the major problems in thinking about governance is making them democratically accountable rather than allowing the powerful to get away with their mistakes or put the impose the cost of their mistakes on others. And I would like to see a discussion about governance and governance failure bring back a critique of ideology and domination. What's the answer to meta -govern uh, governance failure meta-governance, or as I sometimes put it, calibration. Why calibration? You have all know about equilibration, which is the scales of justice, this and that, as if you're only trying to balance two things. Calibration is a wonderful concept introduced by Andrew Dunsire, where what's at stake is multiple equilibria, getting the balance right at different scales in relation to different places, in relation to different time horizons, between different modes of governing, and so forth. And it requires a high degree of reflexivity, a high degree of competence. With two provisos, there's no master meta-governor in the sky. So governance fails, but somewhere, and perhaps it's the, the protocols of the elders of Zion, or the Freemasons, or somebody, somewhere, somebody is pulling all of the strings. Of course, that's nonsense. There are so many different governance problems. There can't be the Archimedean point from which everything can be governed. There's no single summit from which meta-governance is performed. You referred in your presentation to decentered context steering, the idea that what we're dealing with complexity, you have to try to steer, not row, and so forth. And in that case, it's highly contested. It reflects an equilibrium of compromise, which means, in turn, it's prone to governance. Just some of the ways in which calibration works. You can provide the ground rules for governance without dictating everybody's behavior. 
You can create forums or organize dialogue among partners. That's one of the things I've picked up as a result of being here. There's an awful lot of organizing forums, creating forums, creating the space for dialogue. Not to control everything, but to get shared understandings and so forth. You can ensure the coherence of regimes across scales and over time. That's often neglected in the governance literature. Is the intellectual property rights regime compatible with the trade regime, with the environmental regime, with dealing with fuel or climate change and so on? Lots of governance regimes at different levels, but do they, do they actually reinforce each other or undermine each other? Rebalancing power differentials. So Trade unions are a bit weak in the United Kingdom at the moment. You might have expected that. Now we're beginning to think, actually, we need to strengthen trade union organization. One of my favorite pieces of reading every year is the World Economic Forum report on global risks. For the last two years, the biggest threat perceived by the World Economic Forum is increasing inequalities of wealth and income. Not, as you might think, climate change, but the consequences of so pushing the balance of power towards finance, the rich, the wealthy, multinational corporations, the biggest threat now is one of social cohesion. So one implication of that is we must try to reverse, roll back inequalities of wealth and income. Good luck. I say to anybody who tries, without also mobilizing civil society and so forth. Modifying self-understandings. I don't think we can tell people you have the wrong identity, but you can at least mistake your interests. And so pointing out that actually, if this is your identity, if this is your interest, then you need to think about these issues in different ways. Subsidizing the production of public goods organizing side payments. I've heard a lot about that in the meeting that I had with social service organizations. These are public goods they're producing. They need some public support. Don't just rely on volunteers. Exercising supervision. In other words, seeing more that supervision and then also supervising. So guiding, steering, not rowing. And then identify final responsibility when governance fails. The world is very complicated. Everything is related to everything else. But if you're not careful, that becomes an alibi. And we do actually have to hold particular people responsible for the outcome of decisions. Not because they are direct causes, but if nobody, if everybody is innocent, then you lose a very powerful mechanism of democratic control. So I'm sorry you know, if that politician is the victim of circumstance, but at least it alerts the others to the need to check what's going on. So meta-governance failure, very briefly then. If every mode of governance, market, hierarchy, network, solidarity fails, so will meta-governance. So what's to be done? Should we be fatalistic? It's not even worth trying. I'm not getting out of bed this morning because governance and meta-governance are going to fail. Should it be stoicism? I'm a civil servant. I've got a nice job. I know it's going to fail, but at least I'm drawing a salary, my pension's secure. I'm going to go through the motions. I'm going to pretend it's going to work, and when it doesn't, then I'm going to blame somebody else. Should it be cynicism? Nothing works. It really doesn't matter, you know. There are always winners and losers. I'm just going to make sure I'm one of the winners and, you know, to hell with everybody else. Should it be opportunism? I'm the real estate developer. If somebody's foolish enough to think they're going to develop a Silicon Valley in the Ursan region, we'll call it Medican Valley because it's the pharmaceutical complex, that's fine. And then I've made my money by building the infrastructure putting in the bridge. If it works or not, it really doesn't matter. I'm moving on to the next opportunity. Or is there an alternative solution? Because obviously, I don't want to be a fatalist. I don't want to be a stoic. Sometimes I am, but I don't want to be that my general personality characteristic. I'm very cynical, but in the nicest possible way, and certainly not by taking advantage of governance failure. And I would be much richer than I am now if I were an opportunist and made lots of sacrifices in order to get where I am now. 
So I'm going to suggest that there are some rules for good meta-governance, and these are my closing slides, which is requisite variety. That comes out of the systems literature. In a case of a very complicated situation, you don't need an answer to every problem, but you need at least a repertoire of answers that by combining them in different ways can be used. This is my idea of what good meta-governance is. You can see no Archimedean point, lots of things continually in flux. So I started with a, an equilibrium between three stones. That's far too static. Meta-governance is a very dynamic problem. Requisite variety. Maintain a repertoire of forms of governance. We need markets, we need hierarchies, we need solidarity, we need self-reflexive organization. Requisite reflexivity. That's the lesson that has been reinforced for me by coming here. The very strong emphasis on reflect, reflect, reflect. Think about what you're doing. Is it working? What do we want to achieve? Where is it going wrong? We're not to blame, or perhaps we are in part, but the world is very complicated. Objects of governance are complicated and so forth. So monitor progress. Check motives. Be prepared to recalibrate recalibrate. One of the things that I've picked up here is the importance of small-scale experiments. So rather than rolling something out on a macro scale, good for everybody, experiment. Different types of experiment, pilot schemes, and that gives you the capacity to engage in reflexivity. And then something I call romantic public irony. Now we all know what irony is, it's saying one thing and doing another. And what I want to do is to suggest, in the light of all my comments, that what's needed in addition to requisite variety, requisite reflexivity, is romantic public irony. And I'm going to go on and present you why public, why romantic. It's not a private irony. The scholar in the ivory tower just looking out and saying, silly people, that's Richard Rorty. He talks about irony, but it's the irony of the ivory tower academic. My irony is public. And why is it romantic? Because it's not tragic, which would be fatalistic or stoical. It is optimistic, future-oriented. So what does it mean? Expect failure. Sorry, let me go back one. Expect failure bound to occur. That's the whole point of my contrarian approach. Expect failure but act as if you intend to succeed. That's the first meaning of irony, saying one thing and doing another. I, I might fail, but I'm going to act as if I'm going to succeed. You can't go into government and say, we're going to fail. Well, actually, I heard that on Wednesday night. We're going to make some major reforms, and we might be thrown out after a while, but people will accept what the, the changes that we've made. But expect failure. So be aware, but act as if you intend to succeed. If you're bound to fail, you can't choose to succeed. But you can at least choose your mode of failure. So I can't choose the right method to govern effectively. But if I can't, then at least I can think, how am I going to fail? Am I going to fail through the market? Am I going to fail through the state? I'm going to fail through reflexive self-organization. Am I going to fail through solidarity or some mix of those? We can't guarantee success, but we can at least choose our mode of failure. You know what's coming next. The difference between you and me, Bob, is you're clever and I'm wise, so choose to fail wisely. In other words, think about What's the right way to fail? And my answer is, it's better to fail together through participation and dialogue than to rely on the market or to rely on government. But we share our knowledge. It's the so-called wisdom of the crowd, which is a bit more than the, 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 the smartness of the design of the neutral sandbox. There's a little bit more to it than that. But think about participation and dialogue. And there's another irony coming, as you might expect. 
by choosing to fail together through participation and dialogue, you reduce the chances of failure because you're drawing on common knowledge, you're sharing expertise, you're sharing knowledge, and so forth. And that reminds those of you that still read radical literature of Antonio Gramsci's slogan at the top of his Ordine Nuove, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So the pessimism of the intellect is expect failure. The optimism of the will, act as if you intend to succeed, and the best way to succeed is through reflexive self-governance. Just one question, final point. I'm not saying that everything now then has to be delivered through <coughs> governance in the narrow sense of reflexive self-organization. The point about collaboration is working out what's best delivered through the market what's best delivered through command, what's best delivered through reflexive self-organization. It's a meta-layering. Markets have their role. My sport is cycle racing. I'm very happy that I have a choice of 28 different racing wheels when I go into the shop, and I don't want to design my own wheel in collaboration with my teammates and so forth. If I want a comb for my hair, I want just to be able to get it on the market. But there are limits to the market. Once we start to roll out markets in the area of land, labor power, knowledge, and so forth, things might start going wrong. There's a place for organization. There's a place for the state, a place for government. But what is it? There's a place for solidarity. There's a place for reflexive self-organization. So there's a layering here. What we want is reflexive self-organization about the right balance and how that changes over time between market, state, organization, reflexivity, solidarity. And organizing that if at a minimum two-level game is, I think, the key to making governance work. And it puts back responsibility for governance to those who are the partners, the stakeholders in how we organize governance. Whether it can only be done in small communities or relatively small provinces and countries or whether it could be rolled out on a global level there are a whole series of issues there of design as well but i think i've given you some flavor of how a contrarian approach casts new light on how to think about governance so we'll stop there <laughs>